70. Marriage and the family. An important aspect of the Christian marriage service, which was once common in many areas and still survives in some, was the crowning of the bride and groom. In the Armenian wedding service, a crown with a cross was worn. Prior to the wedding, on the eve thereof, in the home of the bridegroom, and separately in the home of the bride, bride and groom were crowned and seated on a chair, symbolising a throne. Friends and relatives then danced the circle dance around the crowned person, singing the crowning song. After each stanza, the chorus took the crowned person on a tour of the great Armenian monasteries, declaring in song, Now you are facing the monastery of the Holy Cross, wearing red and green. May God keep you blameless to enjoy your queen. Or, now you are facing the monastery of St. Thomas, wearing red and green. May God keep you blameless to enjoy your queen. And so on. On the wedding day, a procession with music and dancing took the bride and groom from their homes to the church. Both took communion as a part of the service. The bridegroom was mantled as a king, a cross in his crown, a dagger in his belt to defend his realm and dominion, and the gospel clasped to his breast as a principle of dominion. The bride was also mantled and wore a cross in her crown. The Sharagon, or hymn sung, pertained to their coronation. The wedding festival lasted three days, with the king's throne in the wedding hall surrounded by an honour guard. The purpose of the service was to set forth the family as the central area of dominion of the redeemed man and the husband and wife as king and queen, exercising dominion under God. In some parts of Armenia, it was common for men, on coming home, to enter their house declaring, I am Lord. Outside with the ungodly Turks and limitations on his power, here he was a lord in Christ. The Armenian word for queen, takui, was often used as a name for girls and men often referred to their wives as my queen. These old world married services with their coronation rites represented relics of a post-millennial faith, a belief that the redeemed man is re-established in Adam's calling to exercise dominion and to subdue the earth under God. A witness to the fact that the central institution for this dominion is the family. We are told in Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 to 28, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created they them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. This text is of central importance to the significance of marriage. While on an individualistic basis, dominion is primarily given to man, 1 Corinthians 11, 1-16, this does not mean that it is reserved to man. It is unto them, male and female, that God gives the order to exercise dominion. A central aspect of subduing the earth is by being fruitful and multiplying, but it is far from all of it. It is from the family that dominion goes forth. The family is thus the nursery of dominion and the historical centre thereof. Proverbs 31, 10-31 makes it clear how important a woman is to dominion and how practical her calling is. She manages farms and business and is a queen exercising dominion. The Armenian wedding service included a prayer blessing the crowns and praying for the eternal crowns which do not pass away and for a conquest in history over the forces of Satan. Quote, in thy living name, God and Lord, maker of heaven and earth, who made us all things by the word of thy behest, thou fashionest this man, the first Adam, and establishest from him the marriage of Eve. Thou blessest the marriage of Seth, 
and there from the earth increased to Noe. Thou blessedst the marriage of Noe, and there from the earth drew her heritage down to Abraham. Thou blessed the marriages of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they increased on earth and were crowned in heaven. Out of the stock of Judah thou blessed David, and from the seed of David, Miriam, and from her didst beget the Saviour of the world, for thou becamest crowner of all saints. Now with blessing let this crown be blessed in the marriage of these persons, that this servant and handmaid of thine may pass their lives in peace in all religiousness, to the end that Satan be driven afar from their midst, and thy mercy may come upon them, and that we may utter to thee praise and glory together with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and ever. End quote. Genesis 1.28 is often cited with respect to the creation mandate to exercise dominion, but it is too rarely noted that the primary purpose of marriage is not simply procreation, but that procreation is an aspect of subduing the earth and exercising dominion over it. This dominion is total. It is to include all the earth and, quote, every living thing that moveth upon the earth, end quote. This mandate to dominion is to man as male and female, and it is inherent in every institution man creates and every area of his life. It is essential to the life of church, state and school, to the arts and sciences, to every calling and every phase of life, but in its primary assignment and orientation, it is given to the family. The central area of dominion is thus not politics nor economics but the family under God. The family cannot be limited to the modern atomistic family, those living under one roof as husband, wife and children. The marriage unit of husband and wife is the nuclear family, but it is not the sum total of the family. To illustrate, on the one hand, a family with three children, nominally religious, is in no sense Christian, nor an area of dominion. Each member goes his own way, There is no sense of any moral responsibility to God or to one another, nor to the grandparents. This is a marriage and a family, but in a biological sense and a legal sense, not in a Christian or moral sense, in that even adultery and fornication are tolerated within limits. On the other hand, another family has three children, two sons and one daughter. A son and daughter have never married. All three children reside some distance from home. They are, however, a godly family. The parents are supported in retirement by the unmarried son and daughter with help from the other son. The married son was helped through the university by his brother and sister. The family has helped other relatives and some friends as well, and, while absent from their small town home, have been important in aiding some Christian causes therein. All three children are exercising dominion under God and all three have a strong sense of family. The daughter, nearing retirement herself, has more of a family life and her effect on other families and the love she has earned than the lawless mother in the first family. In the first family, family life means little more than a legal sexual relationship and life under one roof, an essentially biological concept of family life. In the second family, family life is a form of social organisation with theological premises so that it exists and governs where no sexual relationship exists. The family as a social organisation is the prime area of dominion. It has far more than personal significance. Originally, and to some degree in some areas of the world, the family, in the larger sense as clan and tribe, has been extremely important. The weakness of these older forms has been the primacy of blood rather than of faith. By insisting on the primacy of blood, the theological significance of the family has been obscured and instead of dominion, the clan or tribe has aimed at power. This has meant a separation from rightful and godly authority and a divorce of power from its justification in terms of an ultimate moral law. However, in the modern world, romanticism and pietism have reduced the family to the personal and emotional level, so that the marriage and the family become purely personal to the parties involved, and they are indifferent to the theological and social significance thereof. 
Thus, the pietist sees Christ as king in the personal sense, my Lord, which indeed he is, but the pietist fails to see Christ as king over church, state, school, family, vocation, arts and sciences, and every area of life. And the pietist thus fails to see the social significance of redemption and Christ's kingship. The family in biblical law controls three central areas of life, the control of which governs society. Any institution or agency which controls children, property and inheritance is the determining agency in any society. Not surprisingly, the modern state in its totalitarian designs has invaded all three areas in varying degrees by means of property taxes, inheritance taxes, status schools and laws limiting the jurisdiction of the family. The state seeks to be the new family of man. The state, moreover, claims dominion over the earth and over man. It has separated itself from God and presented itself as the new God and creator, the source of determination or predestination. The state is thus of necessity hostile to the biblical doctrine of marriage and the family. The state and the family represents two rival powers claiming jurisdiction over the same territory and claiming the same powers of dominion. However, the degree to which the state takes over the government of man from man and the family is also the degree to which it disintegrates the soul of man and the stability of society. Because God located the primary exercise of dominion in and through the family, it means that if church, state, school or any other agency weakens the family, the end result is a weakening of that agency. Dominion is best exercised in every area when it is best exercised, first of all, in the family. The nursery of man's life is also the nursery of man's dominion under God. Because the family as a social organisation is the prime area of dominion, it has also been a primary area of deformation. Social deformation began as the family saw itself as an area of tyrannical power, as in ancestor worship. The family was made into a lawless domain wherein the head of the house or clan exercised vast powers to the destruction of its members. In Scotland, for example, the Highland clan chiefs treated clan members as slaves without title to their lands and lives. In old China, the family could take the life of its members or reduce them to servitude at will. The biblical family is a radical break with the blood family. In the biblical family, ostracism is not, according to scripture, for violations of clan law in the blood family, but for violations of God's law. All members of the family are placed under God's law. Instead of a purely imminent frame of reference, the family in scripture has a transcendental framework and law. Moreover, the particular family is required to align itself with the covenant family as a family of God. The early Christians spoke of themselves as the, quote, third race, as against Greeks and barbarians, and the, quote, Christian race, end quote. As a family, through the deacons, they cared for their sick, unemployed, widows, orphans and needy members. The church must be seen as the new larger family. The twelve disciples replaced the twelve tribes, the old family unity of blood, as the new family government and structure. In the modern world, the nuclear family sees freedom in disassociation from its members. Relatives, grandparents and then children are separated from the family, not only physically having other residences, which is normal, but also emotionally. The smaller the family becomes, the weaker it is. Most people are not mature enough to take the total brunt of one another's foibles and weaknesses. The more people we must live with, the more readily we will make ourselves agreeable to one another. Television is much given to portraying dramatic clashes of persons on frontier outposts, in wagon trains and in like situations. This is nonsense. People in such a context could not afford to quarrel easily with one another. They needed one another too much. As a result, tension and conflict over minor matters, while always present, 
was not as freely indulged in. Those who have known people from the pioneer era can witness to their far greater tolerance of foibles and weaknesses. Such people could speak candidly about the faults of others with no intention of breaking with them or fighting readily about matters of difference. In a modern urban context, we have from thousands to millions of people living around us. Being sinners, we know thus that we have vast resources for fellowship and friendship. As a result, we can quarrel with some and join ourselves to others very casually. We develop a low tolerance as a consequence. People are expendable as friends because there are so many people around us. The result, too, is a lowered ability to put up with the foibles of relatives and family members. The same problem besets the church. A man or woman who troubles one church can move from one congregation to another indefinitely and find a new area in which to exploit their foibles, and the result is an undisciplined situation. The consequence is not dominion, but anarchy. The wedding crown was once common to much of Christendom. It was a symbol of the purpose of the Christian family to function as a particular area of dominion under God, the key area in which children and property are held. If responsibility and dominion wane in the family, they will wane in all society. Technically, the doctrine of salvation means the sovereign act of God's redeeming grace. This act, however, does not occur in a vacuum, and cannot be held in abstraction from life. Man was created to exercise dominion and to subdue the earth under God, to develop the implications of creation in terms of God's law. Man's salvation is his restoration to this calling. Where salvation is present, there man awakens to his calling and works to fulfil it. Salvation means God's sovereign grace and regenerating power in the life of man. The idea of impotent Christianity is a contradiction in terms. The power of God in man's life means active kingship in every area and an immediate battle against the claims of the kingdom of man. The family is the first area of that kingdom and the ceremonial crowning of the bride and groom was an expression of that faith. 